like to welcome you back to our studies. Uh, today we're going to be continuing a story, although we'll be starting a new chapter, so to speak. Um, through our studies, we've kind of been touching on a, a lot of important prophetic current day events that God has prophesied about. We've kind of focused on, in some of the studies, uh, what was happening in Revelation chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 18. And of course, there's some, some major turbulent events happening. And of course, in our look at those, we were looking at Haggai the prophet. Uh, we were looking at Zerubbabel when Cyrus the Great gave him the order to return with the, the first group back to Jerusalem where they could uh, begin rebuilding the temple, setting up the altar, uh, initiating the reconstruction of Jerusalem. And so Zerubbabel went back, about 42,000 people, and they built the temple. Of course, that story is all in the first part of Ezra, which we're not going to read because we already basically went through the important parts of that in our Haggai study. And if you want to see those, you can go. <coughs> sorry, you can go back and watch the the study on Haggai. Um, but Zerubbabel came back, set up the altar, uh, laid the foundation for the temple. Through Haggai the prophet coming in and animating God's people, they continued the building of the temple until it was finished. Now, one of the things that's important as we're thinking about that, God's people heard his voice, left Babylon, went back to Jerusalem. They began the work. And it's important to think about because obviously there is some spirituality in them. But when we begin to unravel, <coughs> sorry, all the events that are happening during this period of time, we come to understand that even though God's people were listening in part, there was still some problems in God's people that he needed to rectify. And so behind Zerubbabel, behind Haggai, comes the next character in this play, which is Ezra. And his purpose is to bring God's people back to the absolute truth. There is some truth in God's people. Obviously, they're celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, they did many other things that were very important. But in the middle of God's people, there's a bunch of problems and they need it fixed. And so this is the work of Ezra coming in and sorting things out and setting things straight. It's a very important study because I believe as we look at the pro prophecies that were happening through Revelations, chapter 16, 17, and 18, of course, you have some uh, monumental things happening. Uh, the end of chapter 16, our period in time, the seventh vial as it's poured out on the air. Uh, these events that are happening are what we're seeing. Of course, it talks about a major earthquake that shakes up the whole world and splits the great city in three. And I think we're in that. And aside from that, it also talks about this hail that comes down that is a burdensome weight on the people. And of course, we're in that also. But knowing that all of that's happening, of course, we have to understand the punishments of God because that's what Revelation said. It said that those seven vials poured out were God's punishments. The punishments of God come not because we're a fully righteous people, but because we've, we've uh, convinced ourselves that a little bit of sin is okay. We can live with adultery, we can live with fornication, we can live with lying and stealing. A little bit of it is okay. And that's kind of what's happening. We're, we live in a world today where everyone talks about God. I mean, literally, the better part of the world knows about the Bible and God. The better part of the world uh, has evangelical Protestant churches working overtime to take the gospel out, the Bible out. But yet, with all of this knowledge about God, why? Why the chastisements? There's only one reason. We're still sick. 
and we've got to figure out what's wrong. And of course, prophetically, that's what Ezra does. He comes into God's people and helps them understand why they're still sick. Now, <clears throat> it doesn't really do us any good to find out why we're still sick if we're not going to do anything about it. So the importance of reading here in Ezra isn't just to find out what God's people were missing, but the importance is that we examine our own lives, that we look inside of ourselves and say, okay, I've got to not just come out of Babylon, but as it tells me, uh, I believe it's in chapter 19 or chapter 20 of Revelations, it talks about the bride of Christ and it says, and she was dressed in her white linen. And that to me is important because it's high time that we put on our outfit. Uh, our Savior is coming back. And in my opinion, coming back relatively soon. I know he's already doing a great work in his people. But the shaking is going to shake loose the fruit that may not be uh, in good shape. Uh, there will be fruit falling out of the tree. And I hate to say that and I hate to see it because I want everyone to have the joy of salvation, but some people will not. And so as the shaking continues, there will be things falling out and it will be a sad moment. But God is preparing a righteous people. He's building the new Jerusalem. He's building a city. The old Jerusalem was a location on the globe. It was a place people could travel to. It's a place you could go. The New Jerusalem is a different concept entirely because it's based entirely on belief and the obedience of Jesus Christ. Uh, a wonderful passage just to understand the concept of the New Jerusalem is in 3rd Nephi chapter 12. Uh, God's disciples came together and were questioning some certain things about the church. Uh, including what its name should be. And it's a very simple passage. There, starting where they've got that, that, that prayer and fasting and the question about the name of the church, reading there to the end of the chapter, <clears throat> you'll get a good idea of what the New Jerusalem really means. Now, in prophetic terms, uh, Zerubbabel already came in. He already set up the, the altar. He already set up the temple. We already have the restoration of the church, April 6, 1830. We already have a lot of work uh, in the building of that temple. But there is a piece still missing in the building of the temple, in my opinion. Uh, but there are things that are ahead of us that we need to be looking at also so that we can see which direction God's going. And in my opinion, that's where Ezra comes in. Ezra tells us our future and what God's plan is. So... We have an image here. This image shows us the fall of Babylon. This image shows us the return of Zerubbabel. This image shows us approximate time frames. I don't want anyone to think that these numbers I put in here are absolute. They're approximate on the best information that we have. Uh, the return of Haggai when he prophesies to God's people. Of course, we have the period of Ezra and then the period of Nehemiah. Our focus in this study of Ezra is just going to be Ezra's period. And so if you've read the whole book of Ezra, you'll know that actually the first six, <coughs> sorry, the first six chapters do not focus on Ezra's period. That's why we, we took care of them, uh, kind of going through the high points in our Haggai study. Now we're going to begin in Ezra's period which starts with chapter 7. In, in the book of Amos, we have a wonderful prophecy in chapter 9, verse 11. It says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. And this is the prophecy that in many ways is referring to several periods of time. Because one of the interesting things about prophecy is, although most prophecy has a focal point, it has many repeated fulfillments. And we're going to see some more of that in what we're going to read today in Ezra chapter 7. But this is speaking about today. 
uh, David, the tabernacle of David here, here is the tabernacle of Jesus Christ, the lineage, the last king, okay, the last high priest. The tabernacle of David was fallen. It's being lifted up. It had breaches. That means that there were openings in the wall. The breaches are being closed up. Uh, the ruins are being uh, cleared and rebuilt. And it will be rebuilt as in the days of old. Of course, we know it can't be the Jerusalem of old because the Jerusalem of old exists. It's over in the Middle East. Uh, and is a thriving city, beautiful uh, in its own right. But what God is building up today is a different Jerusalem, which is why it's called the New Jerusalem. It doesn't have a necessarily a physical location on the globe, but rather it has a spiritual location. And that's important to understand. And so what God wants us to do, you know, sometimes people say, should we go to the New Jerusalem? And my answer is you should be close to other believers of Jesus Christ because in strength we help each other. That's what a lot of this is about. We need to be able to help each other and do that which is good and right and serve God. And to do that, we have to be a group of believers. No one, I repeat, no one can be a lone believer on a mountain. You can't do it. I don't care if you think you can do it. You can't do it. God calls his people together as a group. In order for you to be able to be a lone believer out in the middle of nowheres means that you have to deny everything Christ established. If he established a church, it was because it was necessary that there be a church. So, what, what do we have here? Of course, we have the time of Zerubbabel. The rebuilding of the altar, the rebuilding of the temple. Now we're coming into, in our study, the time of Ezra and the law. Now, when I say law here, we're going to see that Old Testament speaking, of course, it was speaking about the law of Moses. Today, it's referring to the law of Christ, and that's important for us to understand. And then there was this third time period, because there were three main immigrations from Babylon back to Jerusalem. The one was Zerubbabel, which was about 42,000 people. The one that we're going to be reading about in the time of Ezra. And then in the time of Nehemiah, when he came back and rebuilt the wall. So you can kind of see, if you think about these three periods of time, how that fits that prophecy in Amos 9. All of this is there. It's the rebuilding of all the parts so that you have something perfect before God. And of course now... It's not a rebuilding by God, it's a, a, a rebuilding by man, but rather it is a rebuilding by God. He's doing this, and he is the only one can do it perfectly. So some prophecies, uh, some, a verse in regards to the first two time periods, uh, Zerubbabel's time. It said, and know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Very important because that's the building of the temple. Each one of us, God is establishing, he's pulling us together. And I've heard countless testimonies of people uh, in the world, in other churches, wherever they are, in the middle of nowhere. And God came to them and directed them to the church of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that all of them stayed or that all of them converted or that all of them completely understood what it was God was doing. But essentially, God is doing this work and it's happening. I've heard testimonies of it countless I mean really countless then we advance to Ezra's time and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean and this is what Ezra came in to do Ezra came in to clean up the temple's now been rebuilt the people are there they're celebrating the feast of tabernacles but there's still some problems and God needs to clean it up. And so that's where Ezra comes in. Now, the restoration of the church and our ability to bring offerings to God was really the prophetic period of uh, Zerubbabel. Now, we're in this greater comprehension of what God truly expects or teaches, the deeper understanding of God's law. That's what Ezra kind of, in some ways, came in to do. <clears throat> We're not all on the same level. We're not all in the same place. 
In no way should we judge where we are or compare where we are as individuals with other people. You may be, you know, farther ahead than the average Jew, so to speak, or you may be farther behind. It doesn't really matter. The only one who has the perfect understanding of that is God. He is working with all of us. And we need to remember that. Sometimes it's very difficult to remember that because, of course, we think that everything should be on an equal balance, so to speak. It can't because each one of us is in a different place. So God is working with all of us and he's trying to help all of us achieve something greater in our life. And that's what he's doing. And so we're not really going to get into uh, Nehemiah's time in this study, uh, perhaps in a later one. We'll see. But <clears throat> the Nehemiah time really is the finishing up of this cycle of work and the rebuilding of God's people. And so that's, that's kind of what we're going to be looking at. And so interestingly, uh, just in case you wanted to read uh, something in the middle of this study as we're going through it, because I guarantee I won't be putting it all up really fast. I, I do record the studies as I'm, as I'm able. But if you want an interesting side note to read, in between the time of Zerubbabel and Ezra, we have the story of Esther. Esther and her time and what happened in her own life. And you can kind of read that and, you know, kind of mentally remember this is part of this overall story we're looking at also. And that's very interesting. So without further ado, let's get into Ezra. We're going to be, like I said, starting in Ezra chapter 7, verse 1. And we're just going to go ahead and read through it. Uh, I don't know if we'll read through all of the rest of Ezra, but I, we're going to be reading through it for the most part uh, and trying to focus on the most important pieces of our story. So, verse 1, Ezra chapter 7. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Atub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Marioth, the son of Zeph Ze Zerhiah, the son of Uzi, Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishu, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This is important to set up in the beginning of this story because we need to know who Ezra is. Ezra is a direct descendant of the lineage of Aaron, the first high priest. That's important because he's coming in in this role of reestablishing things as a high priest would. That's important. So, verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylon and he was already scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given and the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord, his God, upon him. And so Ezra, this is kind of giving us the overview right now. It's going to get into the specifics in the next chapters. And so it says Ezra went up to Babylon. He wasn't in Babylon per se, but he was in the surrounding areas. He went up and he spoke to the king. <clears throat> he himself had prepared himself. That's vitally important. We can't really serve God well in whatever capacity we would like to if we don't prepare ourselves personally. Ezra prepared himself, and I think he's a wonderful example for all of us. We all need to be preparing ourselves for our role in this next part of the story. And so he goes up and he speaks with the king, and God has already touched the king's heart. This is not Cyrus the Great. We know that Cyrus the Great's heart was also touched by God when he sent Zerubbabel back. This is a different king. And in comes a different person than Zerubbabel, Ezra, but God is still there. And it lets us know that it doesn't matter who the kings are. It doesn't matter what their personal beliefs are. Because I'm going to guess that Artaxerxes probably wasn't a believer in Jehovah. He was probably uh, an idolatrous or, uh, person probably believed in Marduk or Bel or one of the other gods of that period of time that the Persians tended to follow, uh, probably not Jehovah. And so when Ezra comes in and begins speaking about God, uh, Artaxerxes has every reason to 
to be at odds with Ezra because of their religious beliefs. Yet God is already working on Artaxerxes to make sure that Ezra can do what he needs to do. That's very important. So we kind of have a lineup here, and, and this lineup really more than anything is just what we get out of the scriptures. That's important to note because when we get into actually, if you do some real good uh, work uh, on history and archaeological discoveries, you'll find that archaeologists tend to write off the validity of the Bible at this point because they feel that the kings don't line up. But uh, I suspect there's still a whole lot more for us to find archaeologically. Day by day, we keep finding new things that come out and give us more evidence that, <coughs> that the Bible had it right all along. So for the, mo for the most part, I'm always going to follow what the Bible says, even if I include in some things uh, from our, historically, uh, our historical finds in archaeology. But our story here is Cyrus the Great is when Zerubbabel went back. And we know from that story in Ezra 2.2, it was in the first year of Cyrus the Great. However, it may not have been in his first year. And why I say that is because really Cyrus had uh, a couple first years, you might say. When he became the king of the Persians and then the king of the Medes as a joint group of people, then as he conquered all the foreign nations around Babylon, as he worked his way towards Babylon and eventually took Babylon. <clears throat> now, he didn't wipe out Babylon. He didn't destroy it, per se. He took charge of it. And so my first guess is that this first year may be his first year as king of Babylon. I may be wrong, but that's my suspicion when it says the first year here in the, in, in the biblical text. Now, Haggai comes in in what is called the second year of Darius. And then Artaxerxes, what we have in our current text, uh, Ezra returns in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. And of course, Nehemiah is said to have returned in his 20th year. And this is kind of the layout that the Bible gives us. So just so we have a little bit of a visual representation of what we're going to be looking at. Let's continue. Verse 7, And there went up some of the children of Israel, and the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethinims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart, to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. To me, that verse 10 is, is probably the most critical verse and most of what we're going to be reading in this study. Ezra, as an individual, prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. That's what we need to do. <clears throat> That's very different from the idea of reading scripture and deciding this is what the law of God is, and then trying to order everyone else around, around us, hey, you've got to do this. Hey, you've got to do this. No, that's not what God's looking for. God's looking for us to look inside of ourselves. 100%. He says, look inside your heart, prepare you. That's our first goal. We cannot help anyone else until we've helped ourselves. And we can only help ourselves if we search out God and his law in our own life. Just because God puts something on your heart does not mean he's putting it on everyone else's heart. And that's important to remember. You may be needing God to focus on the Sabbath day, for instance, in your own life. Well, follow it, do it, do what God's telling you to do, but don't look at everyone else and judge them evil for not doing what you're convicted to do. Everyone, is, everyone who is searching God, like Ezra, is being convicted one by one in what God finds most important for them at that very moment. And that's the faith and the trust we have to have. Sometimes we have wonderful moments where we see that in other people. And we can hear their testimonies sometimes as they're bearing witness. 
to what God's telling them. And that's wonderful. But oftentimes we don't hear their testimonies. Oftentimes we don't know what God's working on with them. But just know, if they are truly seeking for God, God is inspiring them and working on them. And live in the joy of knowing that God knows what he's doing. He is a very good architect and very capable. And so let's just put our trust in him, focus on our own lives, our own personal lives first and foremost, and work towards being able to help other people as God gives us the inspiration to do so. Let's continue. Verse 11. Now this is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. I love this verse 11. It gives me a suspicion that quite possibly uh, in the future, this letter could show up. Uh, At the moment, there is no archaeological evidence for Cyrus telling Zerubbabel to go back or for Artaxerxes telling Ezra to go back. But here it gives us to know that there was a a letter written. And because it's focusing on that, I have the suspicion that we we might find it. We might find a part of it, a clay tablet, a piece, a broken piece of a tablet that lets us know this passage is 100% right. But we haven't found it yet. So I just keep, you know, I watch archeology span and watch what finds are relevant to the story and other stories and wait patiently for God to do his wonderful work because he's awesome at doing it. Verse 12, Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of God of heaven, perfect peace, and at such a time, I make a decree. This is coming from the king Artaxerxes. He says that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. So he's putting out a declaration. Everyone who wants to get on the bandwagon with Ezra and go back to Jerusalem. Verse 14, for as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God, which is in thy hand. And so he's looking at what Ezra's saying. Ezra's saying, my God tells me I need to go back and get things straight. And he's saying, that's wonderful. I agree with you. You, based on your own law, need to go back. Take whoever you need with you. Take whatever you need with you. Get the job done. Verse 15, and to carry the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in is in Jerusalem. So the king also wants to give a free will offering for the blessings of God. Now, we shouldn't take this wrong. It would be easy to read this and assume that Artaxerxes was a believer in Jehovah. That may be the case. Uh, historically, we don't have any evidence even close to that. And so more likely, the reality is, Artaxerxes covering all the bases. He wants to make sure that Jehovah, if he exists, blesses him. And so he's giving an offering to take back for that purpose. That's just, you know, that's the most logical way to look at it at the moment until other evidence comes out. Verse 16, and all the silver and gold that thou canst find in all the providence of Babylon, with the free will offering of the people and of the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem, that thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, with their meat offering and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. And whatever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren, to do with the rest of the silver and gold, that do after the will of your God." So he's basically giving him this money, go back and make sacrifices for us, for Babylon, for the Medes and Persians, for the kingdom. And he's saying, go back, uh, buy you know all you need, do it. If there's any money left over, do with it as you see fit based on the will of your God. So obviously Ezra just can't go out and spend it how he will, but to a certain degree he can, as long as it's in the will of God. <clears throat> 19 through 22, the vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God, those deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem. 
And whatsoever more shall be needful of the house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. And I, even I, Artaxerxes his king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, shall require of you, it shall be done speedily. Unto one hundred talents of silver, unto one hundred measures of wheat, unto one hundred baths of wine, and unto one hundred baths of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. <clears throat> so basically, he's telling Ezra, once you go back, of course it says here, to all the treasurers across the river. Uh, where Ezra is in Babylon, he's going to have to cross the Euphrates. So that's what it's talking about. All of uh, the jurisdiction under Artaxerxes, under the Medes and the Persians, on the other side of the Euphrates, he's sending this letter for them also, that they might know whatever Ezra needs, do it. The king is operating under my control. And so he goes and he also gives them not just this treasure to take with them, but he also says, here is uh, another amount uh, that if you need anything else, you can count on it being there up to a certain amount. And so Ezra basically has the entire blessing of the kingdom on him to return and do the will of God. Now, one of the things that's important as we're reading this is to bring into focus the time period, as I talked about in the beginning. Zerubbabel went back, rebuilt the altar, or reset up the altar, rebuilt the temple. Uh, Esther is in the background, in the same region. She's in the background doing her own thing. Haggai comes in and is inspiring the people to march forward even though their enemies are camped around them. Now in comes Ezra, and this is important because alongside all of this, there are other players in the background also that we don't always see. One of these players, as we find more and more historical evidence, is Malachi. Now just keep Malachi in your, in your mind for a moment because we're going to go and read a piece of Malachi. As Ezra's coming back and we're questioning, okay, the people of God, they put up the altar, they rebuilt the temple, they're hearing the gospel. Haggai comes in. They've got a prophet in their midst. What are they missing? Just think about that for a moment because Malachi is going to let us know a little bit. And, and you're, you can read all of Malachi if you wish. I'm not going to read it all in this study. But Malachi is directly pointing at God's people in this period of time. That's both, both very interesting and very enlightening. And also, if you think about all of Malachi, extraordinary. But we'll get into that in a moment. Let's continue with verse 23 to 25. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also, we certify you, that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers and porters, Nathaniums or ministers of his house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or customs upon them. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set up magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach them that know them not. And so he's giving this commandment basically Ezra, you've got to do what God says, and I'm telling you to do it. One, because I don't want Jehovah's wrath against my kingdom. And again, this doesn't necessarily mean Artaxerxes believes in Jehovah. He's just covering the basis for the most part. And so he tells him, everyone who wants to go back with you, take him. More importantly, in verse 25, don't just take everyone back. Not that he's trying to prohibit people from going back, but more importantly, he says, I want you to make sure you're taking back people who can help you in the effort, in the work you're about to do. People that know the law of your God, people that can teach the law of your God and help those that do not know it. This is the real focus. He's wanting to bring back a group of leaders in a way that can help restore everything to where it belongs. Aside from that, in verse 25, he says, also set up magistrates and judges. And so from your position as one of God's chief officers, 
I want you also to set up the physical side of that province, or they call them satraps, satraps in that period of time, this province of the Medes and the Persians in Babylon. Uh, this area of Israel, which is still under our control to a degree, we want you as the right guy uh, to set up magistrates and judges. So Ezra's actually got quite a bit under uh, his uh, requirements of what he's got to do to go back. Not only what God's commanding him to do, but also what the king himself is commanding him to do. So as I said, we're going to take a little bit of a divergence here for just a moment. Jump over to the Book of Mormon, 3 Nephi 11, verses 4 through 9. Uh, we're going to do this divergence because, number one, as we're reading what Ezra is supposed to do and reestablishing the truth, we have to remember this prophecy is for us. But we also have to understand, as Ezra's going back, he's going back for a purpose, a real purpose. And we don't always see what that purpose is because what we read in Haggai, what we read in the first six chapters of Ezra in the Haggai study, looks like God's working with his people. What, what's missing? And sometimes that's where we get. We get to this point where we look and we say, well, the church looks pretty good. There's a lot of good believers here. They're doing a lot of good things. There's a lot of love and charity. We're looking out for the people that need looked out for. What are we missing? That's where this is important to look at it in our story because God's not looking at, not looking for a so-so people. He's looking for an extraordinary people. So, 3 Nephi, and, and I read it out of 3 Nephi, this passage, for a reason. Uh, we'll understand more about that in just a second. But 3 Nephi chapter 11, verse 4 through 9, it says, And these are the words which he did tell unto them, the house of God, saying, Thus saith the Father unto Malachi. So Malachi is talking to God's people. This is what he says. Behold, I will send my messenger. Very important. Most likely, this is Zerubbabel. This prophecy, which we're going to recognize was in Malachi, most likely was speaking of Zerubbabel here. And he shall prepare the way before me. Who's the me here? Most likely Ezra, the high priest who's coming back to set things in order. And the, and the Lord who ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. This is Ezra. He's coming in. The temple's built. When Zerubbabel went back, there was no temple. But when Ezra, Ezra comes back, the temple's ready. Who ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even that messenger of the covenant, covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord. And what will he do? But who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. So Ezra's coming back for a purpose. The purpose is to restore the truth. Verse 6. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. That's an important piece to catch. A lot of people miss this. Well, a lot of people, I shouldn't say miss it, a lot of people focus in this and have a lot of questions. And we'll discuss that in a moment because this passage is not Old Testament. And so the question is, do we have Levite priests today? And a lot of people stumble on that. Let's continue. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge the, the, them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And so this is a prophecy, again, about the time of Zerubbabel and Ezra. In that period of time, approximately, we don't really have an absolute yet, uh, but approximately in that period of time, Malachi comes and gives this prophecy. But the importance of that is 3 Nephi is not Old Testament. The Malachi that Nephi is has quoted here is Malachi 3, 1 through 6. Behold, I will send my messenger, and ye shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So this is the Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. 
This is what we just read in 3 Nephi. Now Malachi is Old Testament, 3 Nephi is New Testament. So that's important to take into consideration. This is where prophecies oftentimes have dual or even more prophetic fulfillments. Malachi 3, as best as we can tell, was written about the time of Haggai and Ezra. Thus, this passage historically was most likely refer referring to Zerubbabel as the messenger and the servant who would arrive suddenly in the temple would have been Ezra. Yet 3 Nephi 11 would be well after the period of Zerubbabel and Ezra and most likely referring to the latter-day parallel that takes place today giving us another interesting piece to our puzzle in regards to the return of Christ. And so we have the restoration of the church under what we will call the Zerubbabel period. Now we're ending the Zerubbabel period and about to enter prophetically the Ezra period. Now Ezra was a high priest. He was coming to restore the absolute truth. This is important because when Christ returns, he will restore the absolute truth and good possibility that the Ezra uh, prophetically is a reference to Christ. I'm not going to say absolutely, but good possibility. So uh, one of the interesting thing thinking about Malachi as being something written during Zerubbabel and Ezra's period of time, uh, it makes us think about the rest of the book of Malachi. And it makes the rest of the book even more interesting. Let's read just for a moment in Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. It says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Of course, we know in the Nephi, third Nephi, talking to the church today, while it's important for us to remember the law of Moses, we're not supposed to get tripped up in it because Christ himself said that the law was fulfilled in him and that we did not need to look towards it anymore. Now, that doesn't mean we should forget it. It's still very important because it gives, it gives us a greater comprehension of many things in the scripture, but it helps us to know that Malachi was actually talking pre-Christ in his prophecy. And that's important because with the restoration of the Levitical priesthood, the purifying of them, that again gives us a focus on time period. That's what Ezra came back to do. It came back to purify the ministry so that the works uh, in that temple that Zerubbabel uh, restored would be done correctly. So, verse 4, Malachi 4. Remember ye that commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So in this period, we've got the messenger coming back. We've got, you know, the, the, the servant coming. But in between here is the prophet coming, which is interesting because in between Zerubbabel and Ezra, who do we have? We got Haggai. He's not the only one, but he's the important one to getting the work going on the building of the temple. And so in between this period of time today, we have the restoration of the church. Then we had this in-between period where God tried to animate his people in marching forward in all that is good and right. Part of that really, I think, began with the stimulating uh, of God in the international outreach that he started in his church. Africa, the in, uh, India, the Philippines, Mexico, all these places where God's sending his missionaries. It's kind of, I think, in some ways, been this prophetic moment animating us to march forward. But that lines us up for that moment when the servant comes back, the one we all earnestly wait for, the one who is going to set things straight. And so that's what we're really looking for. And all of this has been changing. So this iteration of Elijah could also have been referring to Ezra, but I'm guessing it's probably referring to someone in between. And so that's just some interesting things to think about. Hard to, hard to be able to place prophecy sometimes. We just do the best we can. Let's continue in Ezra chapter 7, verse 26 and tw through 28. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. That's a pretty big 
uh, power that Ezra's coming back with. I mean, he's coming back not just to verbally set things straight. He's coming back to really set things straight. Whoever won't do it, man, wipe them out. Take their properties, kick them out, execute them, whatever. Banish them. This is very serious. This is no joke. This is not just a warm, fuzzy Ezra's coming in to animate the people. No, this is a major effort coming in. And of course, this is very important when we think about Christ's second coming. We think about the parable of the sheep and the goats. And we think about other parables like the wheat and the tares. And of course, we have this major upheaval at Christ's coming because in the parable of the wheat and the tares, the tares are, they're ripped up and thrown in the fire. In the case of the goats, Christ lays it out. He says, you know, you heard about me, you knew about me, but you didn't do the things I wanted you to do. You're out. And so there's this major upheaval. And that really fits in well with what we're looking at in Revelations chapter 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Because, of course, we're looking at that up to that moment when it says that the bride of Christ has put on her white linen garments. And that's what we're hoping for. This is what Ezra's coming to do. He's coming to set that stage. Verse 27, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, and hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty princes. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. And so Ezra appears like he, I mean, he had a certain amount of confidence. He went to the king, but there's also a certain amount of nervousness. Even when you think you're doing what's good and right, even when you think God's directing you, until you start seeing things like this, I mean, Ezra standing before the king, laying out what's on his heart, laying out what he feels God's directing him to do. But until the king comes forward and says, yeah, you know, I think you're right. Uh, I'm going to finance your endeavor, take everyone you need, go back, do some offerings for me. You've got my seal of approval. I'm sure Ezra was just ecstatic because he, this was a witness, really an impossible witness, you might say, a miracle in what Ezra was feeling he was supposed to be doing. And that is very important. And so we're looking today also for miracles because God is doing the same kind of work today. He's doing things that are just extraordinary and that's so wonderful. And so I hope as we're going through this, you can kind of bring in a little bit of the history. You can also kind of maybe see a little bit of what's happening today in our period of time. We need to be getting right with God. We need to be this people. We need to be the people that the Ezra here of this passage is speaking to and we're becoming a righteous people. We need to think about the fact that while yes, it is completely voluntary to follow God and obey his commandments, the reality of it is our salvation depends on our ability to do it. And we need to step up our game. We need to become the righteous people that Ezra is going back to create and hopefully prepare ourselves for our Ezra, Christ, to return, that he will touch us and find his people ready with righteous garments on. And so I hope this study helps you in your own studies and gives you maybe some hope and also some direction for the day. Uh, may God bless you and take care.